And when I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. And if we're talking tight ends and we're going into round two, maybe round three, give me Ian Thomas, please. Just let's, I mean, let's just do the damn thing. Just based on giving his overall ability. Um, again, I like his arm. I think he can make every throw. The pick at number 12 was in. And we're back. Cover one, the NFL Draft Podcast. I'm Russell Brown. As always, alongside me, CP, Christian Page. CP, how we doing, my man, on this Friday? Happy Friday, Russell. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. You called me Russell. You sound like my mother. I know. Well, see, you always do the thing like, Russell or Russ, like, I don't care which one. But now you obviously have a preference. So it's Russ forever now. Oh, I mean, I don't, I really don't care. It's just. Oh, no, 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 no. You're done with that. (laughs) No, it just throws me off when somebody that calls me Russ forever throws in the Russell. And I'm like, wait a minute, what is going on? But anyways. That's um, true. That's like you calling me Christian instead of CP. It's, you're so immune to it now. Like I, it's weird. But if I talk to somebody else, then I'm like, oh, hey see you know christian i see i can't even say christian it's so hard no, you could. almost messed it up hey. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, it. it's friday a new edition of the podcast if you guys have not been over to cover one.net you guys have been missing a week load of draft content uh and some buffalo bill stuff as well greg thompson the last two days has been putting out some salary cap stuff uh for you diehard bills fans but also if you're a diehard draft fan like we are um in the way we cover the game it is just mock drafts we've got player evaluations which we'll talk about a little bit later in the show um eric turner's been putting some stuff out you've been putting stuff out i've been putting stuff out brad kelly put out some stuff on tyler johnson i know zach hicks has been working on stuff so a ton of stuff has been coming out as far as player evaluations tons of film breakdown so if you guys have not done it you're doing yourself a disservice. So head over to coverone.net. If your web browser's not working, get on your mobile device, your iPad, however you go about your business and download the Cover One app for free. All you have to do is open your app store, search Cover One, you'll find it, you'll search it, you'll download it and you'll love it. It's gonna be a great time. So stay up to date with everything NFL draft, everything NFL uh, throughout the rest of your life, if I might add. So let's jump into our mock drafts. We haven't really had a chance to break these down other than the article form itself, which can kind of be, I don't know, cut and dry a little bit, especially when you're adding just kind of a paragraph and you want to elaborate a little bit more. And I think it's easier to elaborate a little bit more when you're talking about it uh, rather than writing about it. So Christian and myself, and that's so weird. I just said Christian <laughs> just talked about it. We I messed you up for the rest of like 30 minutes of the show. For the rest of my life. Um, I'm scarred. And so every month or uh, on Monday, we dropped our um, mock drafts. We kind of went head to head. We had some similarities, obviously one and two, very similar. Um, we both had Joe Burrow going to the Cincinnati Bengals. We both had Chase Young going to the Washington Redskins. Um, I guess I, I will start here. I know we we talked briefly before the show. We don't want to go into crazy detail of every pick because what we're doing on this show is we're going to do the first 16 picks, and then next week we're going to do a another show regarding some other content, but we will also do the second half of our first round mock draft. So let's start with pick one. Let's start with Cincinnati. You went with Joe Burrow. Um, what did you, I guess, what, what, I, we both went with Joe Burrow. Why is he such a home run for Cincinnati? He's exactly what they need. I mean, there's still enough young pieces around. I mean, I know A.J. Green's not young, but he's still, you know, one of the best receivers in uh, all of football. You have guys like Tyler Boyd, who so his potential the past couple of years. And you got a, a maybe, I don't say a budding star in John Ross, but a top 10 investment a few years back. You know, he said the injury bug. He had the injury bug at Washington. But you want to go forward, and then you have a really solid running back, a three-down running back with Joe Mixon. Zach Taylor, former quarterback, you know, you just want something, you want some kind of foundation piece to kind of spark that offense. Because honestly, I know they went two and 14 a year ago, but Cincinnati's roster, it's not horrible. And, and, you know, maybe the tank was out to get, you know, Tua, Herbert, and now Joe Burrow is going to fall on their lap. Um, Maybe maybe that 
was why the, you know, the reflection of the two and 14 season, but I think they need somebody with a splash. Andy Dalton, he, he was fine. He, he had a solid career in my opinion at Cincinnati, but he was limited. Mm-hmm. And I don't think Joe Burrow's limited. I think he has all the tools to succeed at the next level. And I think he can almost do it right away. Sure. He's going to have, you know, obvious, you know, bumps and bruises as any rookie quarterback would, but I think you're seeing that learning curve isn't as steep for some of these rookie quarterbacks anymore because I think you're seeing a lot of these pro systems kind of adapt some of those college systems. And I think Joe Brady's system now being an offensive coordinator at Carolina, I think kind of shows Joe Burrow's maybe just very similar type of offensive system that he's going to be dealing with at Cincinnati. So for me, I think all the puzzle pieces fit just perfectly. And, and it would just be boneheaded if Cincinnati doesn't make the pick, but they're going to make the pick. It's going to be Joe Burrow. So this is one of those, you know, mock drafts doesn't necessarily mean who we think that they're going to pick and maybe who they should pick. But I think both of this or uh, Joe Burrow matches both of the criteria there. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, I completely agree with everything you're saying. I mean, this is a, an elite player and I've said it on a couple of radio shows and even to some buddies that have asked me about Joe Burrow. I, I'll be honest. I'm a little surprised that, um, you know, more people aren't talking about how elite he really is. Like they say he's good, but, and then he doesn't have like one thing that really stands out. I I think there's plenty of things that stand out as far as how elite he really is. And I would be surprised if he wasn't a franchise signal caller for the Bengals for a long time. I just, I feel like he's going to be that good. Um, Washington, Chase Young. I want to say this about a Jack Del Rio defense. He is their defensive coordinator. Everywhere he's gone, he's had an elite edge rusher. And Chase Young has a premier pass rush plan. He is so well-developed as an edge rusher. He's going to come in, make an immediate impact. And if you don't believe me about Jack Del Rio, when he was in Carolina, they had Julius Peppers, who they drafted second overall in 02. They've had Khalil Mack uh, in Oakland when he was there. They had Von Miller in Denver when he was there. So he's a part of a lot of good defenses because they bring in very good players, obviously, but an ed, a key edge rusher has been the key for them. And I think Chase Young will do that um, without question. Is there any disagreement there? No, not at all. And, and I think there's some people that, well, they, they uh, sent, or spent a first round pick on Montez Sweat last year. who's kind of that stand up defensive end slash hybrid linebacker. But still, I mean, just look at San Francisco for an example. You cannot have too many powerful pass rushing or just overall solid defensive linemen uh, uh, like San Francisco has shown. And, I mean, every year, you know, you you got Bosa, Solomon, Thomas, Eric Armstead, uh, uh, DeForest Buckner. you got so many guys up front. And where were they this year? They're in the Super Bowl and probably should have won the game, if we're being honest. So I I think this is Washington. I'm not saying Washington's defensive personnel is as talented as San Francisco, but I think – you know, with guys like Jonathan Allen, Deron Payne, Montez Sweat, and Chase Young, that's a force to be reckoned with. So I definitely think you just add, you know, more fuel to the fire here with Chase Young. And like you said, I didn't even realize all those uh, players that Del Rio coached. But when you look back, it's like, wow, he's coached some, like, Hall of Fame-type players. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be premature just talking about it, but Chase Young has all the ability of those guys that you mentioned. So I'm really looking forward to that marriage between Del Rio and Young. Absolutely. Um I I don't know how you want to go off this now. Do we go uh, you Detroit? Are we going to my mock draft? We go into yours because obviously we both went uh, one and two. And and what we want to do is basically take turns back and forth off each other's picks. So, you know, if you ask me about Detroit, I'll ask you about the Giants and then we'll go from there all the way through 16. Yeah, let's do that. And and I can give my my pick back to and just to kind of, especially with Detroit, just to kind of hear your thoughts about it. But yeah, with uh, with the number thir- three overall pick for Detroit, you went with Derek Brown. Uh, seems like a pretty popular need for Detroit, but why Derek Brown? Why does why does it make sense at number three? Well, I mean, obviously, I I do believe that there will be a trade here. I do think Miami's going to pull the trigger and move up and get to one. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it doesn't happen. Maybe it's the Chargers. Um, but either way, I think the Lions will move back. And I think when they do move back, they could put themselves out of position for Jeff Okuda, but also. I think that they need a defensive tackle and they're going to need a defensive tackle by the time we get to April. So while this is maybe a little premature and me doing too much forward thinking, because I do like Jeff Okuda and I know that's the player you chose for them. I'm all for Jeff Okuda. Don't get me wrong, but I I just feel like when you are going to lose potentially three defensive tackles right now, when you look at it from, from the outside, 
Derek Brown makes a ton of sense. He's my third ranked player on the board. And this was something that we came across last year where Ed Oliver was available over TJ Hawkinson and they chose TJ Hawkinson. It was my sixth ranked player versus my third ranked player. I liked Ed Oliver a lot last year and they passed on him. If they wouldn't have passed on him, sure, they might not have have the potential of an elite tight end down the road, but they passed on a guy that started showing some promise and he'd be still a good fit in this defense and this need wouldn't even be there, especially when this defense is so bad and they've got a terrible defense. So when I talk about the three defensive tackles that they're going to lose, Mike Daniels was on a one-year deal. Snacks Harrison's contemplating retirement, and Deshaun Robinson's got to be re-signed, and Deshaun Hand can never stay healthy. So essentially four defensive tackles that you won't get much production, if any, at all next year. Derek Brown, 6'5", 318, has kind of that Fletcher Cox type ability, in my opinion, with his explosiveness, his disruptiveness. He's so powerful. He takes on double teams with ease, and I just love what he brings to the table and I think he would be great in this multiple defensive front. So I, I'm not against Okuda at all. I think three's a little rich for him. If they move back and do it, I'm perfectly fine with it. But if they take Derek Brown too, I'm I'm perfectly fine with it. So that's that's Detroit. You had Okuda. I or no, excuse me, you had Isaiah Simmons, um, which is great. yeah. I want to talk a little bit about him because I think I mean just hearing all your your thoughts and not not today, but just over over the, the past few months about the linebacker issues that Detroit constantly has. You know, Jared mm-hmm. Davis has never met that bar that was set with the first-round pick. And Jelani Tavai, a, a year ago, you did not like that pick in the second round whatsoever. <laughs> people did. Uh, and then, if I'm not mistaken, both of them were on the injury report at the end of the year, too. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think a guy like Isaiah Simmons, and if you can just picture Patrick Chung with Matt Patricia in the years at New England – who is just matchup specific. You know, you can put him in the box. You can rush the passer. He can line up in, in man coverage. You can, heck, you can even put him as a single high safety. I think Detroit needs that type of X factor because let's be honest, they need some help in the secondary and in the linebacking unit. Why not get a guy that can do both? I mean, you can get a guy that can do three or four things at an elite level. And I mm-hmm. think that you're talking about, you know, talking to your buddies or whoever it may be in the draft circles. Why are people afraid to admit that Joe Burrow's elite? I'm kind of in the same argument. Why can't people? Why are people afraid maybe to talk about Isaiah Simmons being elite? And it probably is the fact that he doesn't have that one defined role. Maybe a few years ago that was an issue because I, I talked about it before. But when you kind of have that, sometimes that versatility, sometimes it's kind of like that jack of all trades. You can do everything okay, but maybe not that one thing well. What happens if you can be like a king of all trades instead of a jack of all trades and you do everything at a really high level? That's what you have with Isaiah Simmons. And with the defensive-minded coach that Matt Patricia is and the impact that I think he could have on him day one, I would really like to see Isaiah Simmons in Detroit working with Patricia because I think he could do wonders with him just based on those matchup-specific schemes I think Patricia could run with them. I'd be super excited. I get They need to go defense regardless. Akuda Brown, but I would love Isaiah Simmons in Detroit. I'm not against it by any means. I mean, I as long as it's a defensive player, I don't really care that much. It could be Epinesa. It could be Simmons. I, and I would love Simmons because his versatility, I think, is key. And I, I think Patricia covets versatile players, especially on the defensive side of the football. So I'm all for it. And even if, again, like I mentioned, if they traded back and they were able to land any of those three guys, I think it's a perfect start to the to the the weekend of the draft for the lions. But um, I think you're tipping your hand a little bit as far as maybe your number three overall player on your big board. I think it could potentially be Isaiah. You know, sometimes it just works that way. That's That's just how it happens. Well, speaking of showing your hand, I mean, Dave Gettleman a couple weeks ago talking basically offense alignment, as you described in your pick for pick number four, the New York giants, You've got them taking offensive tackle out of Alabama, Jedrick Wills. I'm really curious as to – I mean, I'm all for offensive tackle. I'm just curious as to why it's Wills and maybe not a guy like Andrew Thomas or maybe a Mekhi Becton. Um, Wills was a guy that I think you had had him in your top 25 on on your big board a few weeks ago. Obviously, more tape has been out there. We've been watching him. The footwork is great. Why is why is it Wills and why is he so high right here right now? Yeah, it's tough because I like Andrew Thomas too. And I think if you're, if we're being honest and just, you know, comparing oranges to oranges, 
the style of play is pretty similar. I mean, I think mm-hmm. both are really solid in their pass sets. Their feet are good. They're both really physical. I think Will shows maybe a little more nastiness and just maybe overall a little more consistent technique. But I really don't think you can really go wrong with either either guy. I think Will, is, Will excuse me, may be a little more polished in some areas. But I think if you just, I mean, get him in, like you said, he just wants to pound the rock. He wants to play in between the tackles. You've got the possibly one of the best running backs, maybe second or third best running back in all of football with Saquon Barkley, that his bread and butter is running in between the tackles. And so you have the personnel to do that. And I think you're just needing that smash mouth type of offensive tackle. We talk about Andrew Thomas and the Georgia offense being in a very bland type of offense at Georgia. They need to catch up with the times. They may now with Monkin coming over uh, and running that offense, but that's a conversation for another day. But I think both guys kind of embody that smash mouth, hey, we're going to hit you in the mouth type football. So I really don't see, but I think Wills right now, and I kind of, I kind of, you talk about showing your hand, I kind of gave way to some of the, the media buzz that's going on. It seems like Wills may be coveted a little higher than Thomas, but both ways, I think either guy would be a really smart pick, especially given what Dave Gettleman has said recently. Absolutely. I mean, I, I can't disagree there at all. Um, I personally had Andrew Thomas. I'm, I mean, I, I think Andrew Thomas, as far as what he can do as a run blocker, I think he's just a devastating run blocker. And with Saquon Barkley behind that, I think it could be a recipe for a tons of success. Um, and I, I think if you can run the ball efficiently, it will help you, uh, especially when developing a young quarterback like Daniel Jones. But I, I, I agree. I don't think you can really go wrong um, at all with either um, either pick so or either player excuse me so Miami is the next team um I don't know do you want to just run through five and six because we have the same like one and two here yeah I mean there's not much we can add I mean I can I can spoil it here with Tua going five to Miami and Herbert going six to the Chargers because I mean both the the, it's the obvious perception you know both both teams need quarterbacks Miami you know they kind of bridged with Fitzpatrick this year Rosen doesn't look like he's going to be their long-term guy uh, and then L.A., there's the rumors with Phillip Rivers moving his family to Florida, whatever it may be. So they're going to look into the quarterback market regardless, even if Phillip Rivers is their quarterback next year, which may be helpful for a guy like Justin Herbert, who has a little bit of kind of Phillip Rivers in his game, a far more athletic Philip mm-hmm. Rivers. I think when you're just looking at maybe just prototypes, they kind of have some similarities. But, uh, yeah, for five and six, that's really all I have to say because – we can talk about quarterbacks another day, but both teams need them. Both teams are going to look for them this offseason. For sure, and especially with Tua in Miami. I mean, it, it, they've been talking about Tua in Miami forever, and it just seems like it's a destination at this point. And, um, you know, Miami, they've got six picks in the top 70, so they've got the draft capital to move up and get them, and that's why I think it's going to be an intriguing uh, trade that eventually happens between Detroit and Miami and obviously it's two Patriot guys or former Patriot guys there. So it all, it just makes way too much sense. Um, am, am I next on the board here or who, who's next? Is it? Is Go me? for it. Um, okay. Next. So Carolina, I have him taking it. Isaiah Simmons. I, I think it's a huge need. And if Simmons is there, Luke keekley has gone. I'm not saying he's the traditional middle linebacker because I don't think he is, but you need to find a way to fill the void at linebacker somehow, some way. And you have Shaq Thompson, you have now Isaiah Simmons in this particular mock draft. So I think, you know, you get an instinctive player, you get a guy that is so versatile, like you've talked about, you can play him anywhere. So I, I'm a big fan of just this specific move um, whatsoever. And then you had Jeff Okuda there. Um, I, I can't disagree there by any means. They, I mean, if any one of those two guys is there, I think it's it's fine. I had Okuda still on the board, so I went with Simmons just because I think linebackers are bigger needs. So um, let's go to Arizona at eight. This is a I just think a very interesting pick. What with what we both have, we have both going receivers. We have two different receivers. I love your your player that you took. You took my wide receiver one, CD Lamb, going to the Cardinals at eight. Yeah, and we talked about it. I think it was last week. We talked about the relationship, you know, with with Kyler Murray and C.D. Lamb of how that makes a lot of sense. You know, could they look at possibly addressing the offensive line here? Maybe so. I mean, Tristan Wirfs, I think, is a guy that is a plug-and-play guy, either left tackle or right tackle, had some experience at Iowa this year at both positions. But I think you got to get some firepower on offense, you know, whether that is receiver uh, or another skill position at some point in this draft. But C.D. Lamb, like you said, 
you know, the more and more I watch him, the more and more I think I may be in agreement with you that he is wide receiver one. His skill set is just very translatable, so versatile. And I know he's not this maybe big time like speed demon track star, but I think, you know, just when you're looking at all the technical ability that he has, it's hard to really pass them up. And I know you're going to talk about another receiver that has those abilities too, but maybe a little more raw in some areas. But I just definitely think Arizona needs to address that firepower because we know, you know, if the, all these pieces are together for Cliff Kingsbury, this offense will be really fun to watch. Oh, without question. And and that's something like people comment on the mock drafts and they're like, Arizona needs an offensive tackle. What are you doing? This and that. And I'm with it. I mean, if they take an offensive tackle or a wide receiver, I think either one's a home run pick for them. I don't think there's really a wrong answer because I really like all of the offensive tackles that they would have available to them. And I like the receivers. I personally like Henry Ruggs for them. Just his, his, I mean, his, his speed is just incredible overall he's just so explosive and I think the big play threat that he possesses I think he's getting better as a route runner I think he's getting better at tracking the football I think he's just getting better overall as a receiver and going to become more complete and I think that big play ability makes for a ton of success nine Jacksonville I have them taking Jeff Okuda out of Ohio State he falls right into their lap in my mock draft. He replaces Jalen Ramsey, who they traded away, and they got a first-round pick out of that. So, I mean, you get a man cover corner with some serious length at nine. I think it's tre- tremendous value. I think it's a, it's a good fit. I think it's an ideal fit. Um, you have them taking Jerry Judy, which I can't disagree with. Um, I, I'm kind of curious as to Jerry Judy – do you think he complements DJ Chark like perfectly or do you think it's more so like you almost get, I don't want to say like a few years back when they had like Allen Robinson and you get into a situation where like Chark just kind of plays out play or plays so well and kind of into a, a bigger contract to where they eventually will have to replace Chark as well. Does that make I sense? Mean, yeah. I mean, I guess you could look at it that way. I think they could complement each other really well. I mean, Chark is, shown a little more consistent route running ability than I remembered at LSU. Mm -hmm. Um, So maybe there is a little bit of like, oh, well, you know, you know, Jerry Judy's more of that possession receiver. He can beat you at all levels of the field, you know, short, intermediate, and the deep ball. Um, And Chark's shown that he can do that too. But again, if depending on, you know, what they're doing at quarterback, you know, I know they're committed to Nick Foles, I think for two more years, whatever it may be, but you have maybe a some trade bait or, or maybe your your quarterback of the future with Gardner Minshew. And it looks like Leonard Fournette, you're going to have a conversation about his contract going forward. So maybe it would be just nice to go into an offseason, maybe a couple years down the road and not even have to really worry about wide receivers. You know, you can lock up DJ Chart. You know, you have to make a decision maybe on D.D. Westbrook, how he's been, uh, I'd say, for the most part, consistent. He's been okay for, for where you drafted him. So, um, I just think it makes a lot of sense with just the offensive personnel or what there's lacking in, in, in Jacksonville. I think Jerry Judy would complement, to answer your question, would complement the skill set of DJ Chark. But I think there are some needs, especially at corner, you know, with the obvious vacancy of Jalen Ramsey now in an L.A. Rams uniform. So I definitely understand the Akuta pick well. I think there's a couple areas that Jacksonville needs to address, but we'll see. You know, they got some extra picks down the road, so we'll see what they tackle when the it- draft comes around. It's crazy how, like, you know, they were a playoff team a, a year and a half ago, two years ago, whatever, and it just now it seems like they're so far away now, once again, from being that playoff team. And granted, I mean, Tennessee, the Colts, the Texans are all very good teams that have ingredients to, to I think, be successful down the line. But Jacksonville, just it just seems like they're so far away now because they need another receiver. They need a number one corner. They probably need some linebacker help, probably – you know, probably a tight end. There's, I don't even know who their tight end is. So, I mean, it's just like, it's just, it's, it's wild that they have taken kind of this big of a step back, but it is what it is. Teams that taken a step back, maybe didn't even really take a step forward. The Cleveland Browns, there were such high hopes for them. Um, They're picking 10th. We both have them taking offensive linemen. Um, I want to get your thoughts. Obviously I've talked briefly about Andrew Thomas, but I had them taking Jedrick Wills. You have them taking, Andrew Thomas out of Georgia. So we both talk him briefly about both players, but why do you like the fit for Andrew Thomas in Cleveland? Yeah, I think it's something they need. I mean, they want to run the football. They showed that. And I know they have 
uh, you know, the personnel that may state otherwise. But with Nick Chubb, I think, what, the second leading rusher in the league a year ago? It was yep. kind of a quiet year. And what does Georgia like to do? What's the scheme that they like to, you know, push the ball? And, and you know, not making that like a poor man's comparison with the fact that Georgia – or Nick Chubb played at Georgia and Andrew Thomas was his left tackle. But I think that makes a lot of sense just based on really what they want to do. They want to play downhill – open up the play action pass to get it to the skill set receivers with Jarvis Landry, Odell Beckham Jr., assuming that he stays there, who knows, uh, and, you know, some other pieces, David Njoku, if he can stay healthy. So I think Andrew Thomas makes a lot of sense here. They need, uh, you know, some promise at left tackle. Greg Robinson came over from the Rams. I know he was a bust at pick number two, I think in the 2014 draft it was at the Rams. Uh, but he's been okay. But Chris Hubbard has not been good. Uh, I think he's in a contract year, so he's probably not going to be retained. So maybe if there is some flexibility at left and right tackle for Andrew Thomas, I think he's a plug-and-play guy, which also makes a lot of sense for Jedrick Wills, who you have Cleveland picking as well. Yeah, well, I mean, especially when Baker Mayfield loves to roll to his right, it would make sense to get a, a really good right tackle. Um, to I think an ideal right tackle, especially uh, with his foot speed. So uh, the New York Jets at 11, Tristan Wirfs is who I had them take. I like the thought of getting some protection for Sam Darnold. He's been banged up the last two years. That's not a good start uh, to a guy that you're going to have for the next five years. You need, or well, the next, the remaining three years, but over a five year span, you need to make sure he's staying upright. And I think Tristan Wirfs is a quality offensive tackle. I really like him at the right side. I think he needs some help with the footwork. There's times that he likes to lean forward and get up on the balls of his feet, uh, which I'm not necessarily against because he's so strong but at the same time it just looks awkward but he's got some serious grip strength he moves well in space former state champion wrestler he understands pad level I I like him a lot I think he'd be a really good fit for them at right tackle and I I think he'd be an immediate day one starter you had them take Henry Ruggs Um, is this simply because you feel like they're going to move on from Robbie Anderson and they need uh, even if they kept Robbie Anderson they would need to get another weapon in this offense yeah, I think so. And Robbie Anderson, I think he's relatively cheap. I think he signed for three or four million dollars. Like he's not going to be, you know, a, a cap casualty, so to speak, if they were to re-sign him. But I do think he is a free agent. Demaryius Thomas was on the roster a year ago. You know, he's aging. He's not as effective. And Jamison Crowder was, I believe, an addition a year ago. So I think just kind of finding that dynamic wide receiver. And I'm with you. It's kind of like I think New York and Arizona are kind of in that same predicament where you could address the offensive line, but you could also dress the wide receiver room so you know potato potato however you want to go about it um I I think those are the two areas of need that need to be addressed immediately in the first round with their pick at 11 so I went with Henry Ruggs sure he's a little raw in some areas but I think he kind of gives that that consistency he gives kind of that hope to Sam Darnold when you know making plays happen you know when things break down Henry Ruggs and I don't think he gets enough credit for some of his route running we talked about it a couple weeks ago you know on some of the comeback routes or breaking off some of his routes to find the cushions uh, in the zone coverage or just simply beating his man out uh, of the coverage uh, uh, that they were going with so I, I like Henry Ruggs as a fit and as just a need in general. I don't think it's one of those like, you know, hey, let's hurry up and freak out because, you know, uh, I don't know what other wide receivers are going to be available round two. I think schematically this is a really good fit. If Adam Gase even has any fits for his offense, dun, dun, dun. But uh, I definitely think that Henry Ruggs makes a lot of sense just based on the maturation process with Sam Darnold and what's at the helm. It's been a very fun 11 picks. This is where the draft goes off the rails a little bit at pick 12, the Las Vegas Raiders. And rightfully so. This is, I don't want to say it gets off the rails, but it's just one player is a little splashier than the other as far as position. And the other player we're both incredibly high on. And I'm just kind of surprised that he's available. So I'll start with the splashy one. I've got them taking CD Lamb. He falls into their lap. They get my top wide receiver. They thought by getting Antonio Brown last year that it would work. It didn't. They get a guy that's 6'2", 195. He's just a big play guy. He makes incredible catches. He's creating yards after the catch probably as we speak. I love C.D. Lamb to the Raiders. I even like this pick a little bit more because he's just a tremendous value at 12. Derek Brown to the Raiders, defensive tackle out of Auburn. Um How does he get to this spot in the draft? And is this a guy that maybe, just maybe, if the Raiders are keyed in on him, do they maybe move up a couple spots to try to ensure that they get him? 
Possibly. I mean, it just depends on where he is on their board and they have the ammunition, you know, with the second uh, first round pick later on in the draft. But Mm -hmm. I kind of played a game with myself on purpose, just kind of plan a scenario and not not to say I didn't take this seriously because I did, because like I explained at pick three with Isaiah Simmons, I think it makes total sense for for Detroit to, to go headstrong and go for Isaiah Simmons based on their needs. But you know, say Detroit doesn't take Derek Brown and address that defensive tackle need at three, and say Carolina, who needs some upfront personnel on the defensive line, takes Jeffrey Okuda in this situation because they also need some cornerback help. So where does, you know, Derek Brown, quote unquote, fall to? And I think Oakland, or excuse me, Las Vegas now, I think, you know, partnering up with Maurice Hurst, who, you know, out of Michigan, had an incredible year last year, given the circumstances of how he just fell in the draft. And so, I think you partner him with another guy that's kind of plays a similar style of game. You know, they can be that two gap guy, but they also have a lot of explosiveness. They have some of that pass rushing interior ability, which is always coveted in today's NFL. It's always been coveted in general if you had it. So I think Derek Brown, this may be not necessarily a need for Las Vegas immediately at this point in the draft. But when you have an elite talent, and I'm going to say that over and over again, when you have an elite talent that can possibly fall out of the top 10, you have to pick him up. I don't even care what position he is. Maybe unless you have an elite quarterback and you're not going to draft another one, any other position, I think you can partner up with another elite player. That's why I have Derek Brown going here because I think John Gruden and Mike Mayock would run to wherever they're watching the draft or wherever they're <laughs> from. They would get an Uber uh, immediate jet to Las Vegas, which I guess they wouldn't even have to go far. They could run down there, you know, a couple miles, wherever their facilities are, and turn in this pick. I would love to see Derek Brown in a Raiders uniform. He has he has that Raiders mentality, which we can never really put our finger on. But when you have it, you have it. And I think Derek Brown, that's the guy. That would be – I mean, I'm for it. I'm not, a, I'm not a huge Raiders fan. I like them, but I'm not – you know, I, I'm, I'm for it. That's uh, – I'm, yeah, I, let's do it. Uh, let's boot it up. I, to be honest, though, too – No, no, no. <laughs> let's do it. You have to say the whole phrase. What? Oh, come on. It's in the intro. Oh, let's do the damn thing. <laughs> there we go. Oh, God. Work there, man. Oh, man. Um, but, no, you started talking about the Lions a little bit there, and I'll be honest. If the Lions were to move back, get an additional first-round pick from Miami, and then the Raiders come calling and say, hey, we've got a guy in mind we want to move up, and then all of a sudden they move up, and the Lions are able to get an additional first-round pick. Oh, my God. I'm living in Madden life over here. This is unreal. Um <laughs> You say that, but it's not. I wouldn't, you know, throw it out necessarily because stuff like that happens. Well, and then they could move to 12. They would have 12, uh, what is it, 12, 19, and 20, and, like, they would have, like, 26 or something. I mean, that's fantastic. But at 13, the Colts, let's get back to the mock drafts. 13, the Colts, we both got a guy that makes a ton of sense um, just simply because of the trend of what the Colts have done. They've drafted 10 players from the Senior Bowl over the last three years, Kinlaw, Javon Kinlaw from South Carolina would be the 11th player. We both have him going there. They need help on their interior defensive line. He's got length at 6'5", 315. I I think with his ability as a pass rusher, his ability as a a disruptive playmaker, he makes a ton of sense. Um, I would love him in this defense. I think the fans of the Colts would love it as well. Uh, Do you have anything to add or anything that you disagree with? No, not really. I mean, we, we both have them, like you said, at, at 13. And it's not to say that Indianapolis, and I wrote this in my first sentence in, in the write-up, it's not that Indianapolis' defensive line is, like, bad, but it needs a splash. It needs mm-hmm. some player, especially in division and the quarterbacks that are in this division. I mean, I, I know, like, you know, Ryan Tannehill isn't this explosive playmaker, but with guys, you know, you have Deshaun Watson there and, and among some other players that you got to have some kind of ability to defend the, uh, defend the run and also be on the field for passing downs. And I think Kinlaw shows that interior rushing ability where he can play the three tech, but he has the length to really play any position on that defensive front. So I think he brings maybe a little, I don't say pseudo versatility, because I don't know if he really showed that much versatility at South Carolina, as far as maybe going from zero to three. But I think he gives just something else that Indianapolis needs on the defensive front. Not to say that the players on that front are bad right now, but I think they need, they need a spark. They need a splash. Kinlaw would be that guy and probably best player available too. Oh, for sure. And then at 14, um, Tampa Bay, 
is on the clock. You've got them going offensive line. I'm going defensive line. Um, let's start with your pick. Let's start with the offensive line. We both have them taking Iowa players. Um, Tristan Wirfs, offensive tackle out of Iowa. Um, why, why the offensive line, and, and do you really like the fit of Wirfs in Tampa Bay? Yeah, I think I do. I've been very bullish on – Tampa Bay's offensive tackle personnel, like Dotson's fine, Donovan Smith's fine, but Donovan Smith's getting paid what top five, top eight left Something tackle, like and, and 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 no fit, but he's not worth it. And I think there is, I think there was multiple opportunities in past drafts where I don't want to say an offensive tackle of his caliber could immediately fall in their lap, but I think based on you know the money that's due to Smith, I think you could find a guy that plays with a similar skill set and has more upside. And so I think you cannot pass on that opportunity again with Tristan Wirfs, you know, depending on who you talk to, could be a top 10 talent because, like I said, I think he's that plug-and-play guy. You talked about some of his deficiencies, you know, a, a few picks back, but I think overall he's a guy that you're going to win with for sure. You're not going to lose games because of Tristan Wirfs. So I think maybe if you lock down that right side with Dotson, maybe you just run out Smith's contract, which is probably two or three more years left on it. Um, because Jameis Winston, if they're committed to him, maybe not long term, but at least for another year, you want to be sure that, mm-hmm. you know, you make the right decision. I think you sure up those bookend tackles, you know, whoever it may be, left or right side. You have the wide right receiver uh, capability. Chris Godwin had an awesome year. You know what Mike uh, uh, Evans is capable of and some other personnel pieces there, too. Sure, the running game could be a little better, but it, Ronald Jones took a step forward. So I think maybe those just book and tackle pieces are the missing piece going forward to really just solidify your Jameis Winston uh, evaluation and what you want to do with him going forward. So I think offensive tackle makes a lot of sense here. Best offensive tackle on the board is Tristan Wirfs. Can't disagree there. And I, I like how you talked about, you know, them paying a guy like Donovan Smith a ton of money. Um, they're also going to have to pay another guy, Shaq Barrett, who had a tremendous turnaround season uh, for the Tampa Bay Bucks. But even though he had a tremendous year, they're going to need another edge rusher. And that's why I went A.J. Epinesa. His length at 6'5", 280, 285. I, I think he's got a perfect frame. He would be a really good fit in Todd Bowles' defense. He had 14 and a half tackles for loss last year, 11 and a half sacks. Um, I think he could have similar production in this defense. Uh, pairing him up with Vita Vea, Epinesa, Barrett, I mean – I'm, I, that sounds like a pretty elite defensive line to me, it, at least right now. And it, maybe it, it maybe it doesn't pan out, but I really like it. Um, I, I think it would be a home run. And I think either player makes a ton of sense. So it wouldn't be surprising if Tampa Bay got an Iowa football player come April. So Denver at 15, and then we'll get Atlanta at 16, which we both have the same pick for Atlanta. But Denver at 15, I have them taking Jerry Judy. Um, I think Drew Locke has some potential here to maybe become a, a pretty damn good quarterback. And For sure. you've got a guy like Noah Fant who he's clearly got chemistry with. You've got Philip Lindsay who just is such an aggressive runner, a great just one cut and go type of kid. And then you've got Cortland Sutton who really put it on this year. And I think by adding another compliment to Cortland Sutton, I think is, is key. And it obviously will help the offense. And that's why I got Jerry Judy there. He's still on the board. The only reason why he's there is simply because of some of the drops I think it's a little concerning because there's just times that he makes these drops and I'm like, what are you doing? But it would not surprise me if he was a top 10 pick by any means. Uh, He's got such natural leases. He's very, very good in the open field. He makes guys miss at ease. um, And he's just an explosive playmaker. So at 15, I think it's a really good value, but I think he'll drop a little bit because of some of the drops and teams going in other directions. But for you, you've got Denver going with, a player that we'll be talking a little bit more about here probably in the next 10 minutes, but Makai Becton, offensive tackle out of Louisville for the Denver Broncos. I really like this pick. Um, elaborate a little bit more on, on why the Broncos should move on from Garrett Bulls and they're taking Becton. Yeah, and real quick, just to surface what we were talking about, we're talking Arizona, the New York Jets, and Denver. I think they're, they need to dress you know, their first-round pick with either wide receiver or offensive line because they need help in both areas. Mm-hmm. I really like what you said with Judy. Is it safe to say that, no pun intended, that he's might be the safest player in this class outside of maybe Chase Young and Derek Brown? Uh, pro- I mean, probably, right? But, I mean, I guess the one thing is with receivers, it just always seems like some receivers take longer to develop than others, and 
I mean, even though Judy's been a home run for Alabama, it doesn't necessarily mean it'll translate. I mean, again, the drops could be a concern. And if that ruins his confidence, and if let's say he has like one bad season where he's injured, who knows? I mean, you look at some guys like, you know, he's way better than guys like Josh Doxson and stuff like that. But I mean, if you look at that class, Josh Doxson, um, I mean, Corey Coleman, well, I think he was part of that class. Yeah. Maybe. yeah the, the one where the three receivers went in a row, Corey Coleman, Josh Doxson, you had, uh, uh, Laquan Treadwell and you had um, Will Fuller. I mean, all those guys have struggled to stay healthy, but they were great playmakers when they were coming out of college. I, I still think I would take Jerry Judy over all four of those guys regardless. But, yeah, I mean, I think he, I think he is still a safe pick. I don't know if he would be the safest. I mean, that's, that's – oh, boy, you got – Okay, that. maybe that's an article or, or a podcast for another day. Oh, my gosh. Explain Becton, and I will, uh, I'll, I'll think hard and long about this. So, so going from a safe player to a guy that – uh maybe risk reward type deal uh makai becton i mean there's a lot of physical traits that you'll fall in love with i mean you look i mean if we're just breaking them down from a scouting report perspective and i'll get with you know denver's personnel fit here in just a second but with becton you know for the most part he has pretty good feet i'll let Mm -hmm. you talk about some of the more the past sets that he was i guess taught or or fell victim to at louisville but just based on the physical tools he has. I mean, he's literally throwing guys out of your screen when you're watching him on film. <laughs> and, and, like, I cannot stress that enough. You do not know where the defender goes. He just flies out of your, your radar when you're watching him. But he plays with that nasty demeanor. He has all the physical ability in the world. He moves really well for 6'7", 360 pounds, which is really hard to say sometimes, really hard to do. But I think his feet are pretty clean. And he just adds a, a, an element of pass protection. Uh, to my, in my opinion, to Drew Locke because Garrett Bowles, look, I liked him and, and and I'll throw myself under the bus here. I liked him a lot. I thought he was a great pick for Denver going forward. I thought his film was really good in that zone running scheme that Utah was running at the time. His ability to really maximize every downfield, you know, second level block, you know, he just played with a nasty demeanor. He was really smooth with his kick slide. It was a little choppy, but it was smooth for the most part where it didn't really hamper or hinder him going forward. But it hasn't really been the case at Denver. I mean, even if, you know, he finishes a block or something happens, there's always a yellow flag. I mean, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but outside of Laramie Tunsil, he's probably one of the most penalized players uh, as far as offensive linemen go, maybe just in general, as far as NFL players go. And so I think, you know, if you're going, you know, you're going to move forward with Drew Locke, you need to solidify that left side. Juwan James, I don't know what his con. I mean, I know his contract situation, you know, he's getting paid a lot of money, but it was weird where he was sitting out last year. Was he injured? Was he not? Was he pouting? I don't know. So I think, but he's locked down the right tackle spot. I think they need to address left tackle here because, you know, this class is, is, is pretty strong at the tackle position. I think there's a little versatility between, you know, right and left tackle guys, but I think they're going to go quick. You know, you know mm-hmm. you're going to see five, six, possibly seven guys, you know, depending, depending on, you know, Lucas Niang's medicals, you know, with his hip injury or leg injury, whatever it may be coming back. I wouldn't be surprised if we see six, maybe seven guys in that first round. So you may not have the opportunity to address that, you know, left tackle need for Denver. And if you're going forward with your quarterback, you got to let them feel comfortable. And you talked about Cortland Sutton. I'll put a bow on this. You talked about Cortland Sutton really taking that next step forward for Denver last year. I think there's enough cushion there for them to rely on the depth of this wide receiver class where they can jump on their offensive tackle, the number one guy on their board at the time, and, and go forward there and address the wide receiver in maybe round two or round three. But that's why I think Becton's a fit. Maybe based on, you know, just, you know, the offensive tackle that's, you know, the best offensive tackle that's on the board if we want to go that far. But also I think he kind of brings something that they lacked from Garrett Bowles, just from maybe a physical and a consistent demeanor. Safest picks in the draft. Um, as far as everything you said, I can't disagree at all. But no, you're uh, fine. You don't have to elaborate. That's fine. Um, yeah, Chase Young, obviously. Derek Brown. I'm gonna say he's not super high on my big board, but I think Javon Kinlaw would still be a safe pick okay. over safer over Jerry Judy. Um. It's hard for me to say Jerry Judy would be that high because I have CD Lamb as my top wide receiver. So, like, I feel like if I say, oh, yeah, he's the third safest player in the draft, but then that kind of defeats my saying of CD Lamb's wide receiver one. So, 
I guess I would say probably CD lamb and then Jerry Judy, I guess, I guess I would view it like that. I'd probably throw in an offensive tackle and it would probably be Andrew Thomas for me, but Mm -hmm. that's just my opinion. Um, so yeah, that's probably where I'd be, but 16, let's, let's go back to the mock draft. 16 (laughs) Atlanta Falcons, um, Caleb Von Chasen, that's who we both have them taking, a 6'4", 250 edge rusher. Um, I don't know if this is a real – like, I don't know if that stuff on Twitter with the Falcons was real or not. I'm assuming it was, but it sounds like they're moving on from Vic Beasley. So this uh-huh. is, I think, a clear need for them at, at an edge rusher. But um, why do you like Caleb Von Chasen? And, you know, what, what should it, Falcons fans be looking at with him as an edge rusher? An explosive playmaker. I mean, anytime you watched LSU, I mean, sure, you're watching for the fireworks with Joe Brady, Joe Burrow on offense, and the multitude of receivers and Clyde Edwards Hilaire on offense. But when you watch their defense go at it, Caleb on Chason was constantly in the backfield. I mean, it's crazy. Like, we knew the potential coming in. You know, he played, I think, week one versus Miami, you know, maybe two, three quarters, then was out for the rest of the year. But we knew, and, and I think in that game, he had maybe a sack or two or a tackle for loss. He was making splash plays. For us to, you know, you had to just completely be blind if you did not see him flash on the Miami film. And then coming into this year, we knew that potential. And he just constantly improved week in and week out. He showed out versus Florida, showed out versus Alabama, showed out in the national championship. When you can put your best stuff on the table and in front of the biggest audience against the best teams, that's the guy I want playing for me. And I'm not saying it's just based on production, but the constant pursuit his ability to, you know, convert power to speed, vice versa, his constant quick movements in the upper body, playing against, you know, really solid players in, in, you know, Oklahoma's offensive line or Clemson's offensive line. And even guys like Alex Leatherwood and Jedrick Wills, who we've been talking about, Leatherwood coming back to school for Alabama. But a guy next year, we're breaking down mocks we're going to be talking about in the first round. So he just dominated at all levels, no matter the opponent. And I think you just saw that maturation process from a physical standpoint. And I think that's what you need. You need that spark on Atlanta's defense, something that Vic Beasley didn't bring. You know, he showed some potential his rookie season, but could not get over that hump. But I think Chase on just based on that process he's shown week one to, you know, week whatever, week 16 in the college football season, he answered all the, all you know, he answered all the calls. He, he checked all the boxes, in my opinion. And I think he can only get better with the right coaching staff because the guy's turned into a, one of the premier pass rushers. And he's yeah. even past yeah. guys, in my opinion, like A.J. Epinesa, who's not dull in his pass rushing arsenal. You know, you're talking about safe players. Epinesa could probably maybe be on that list as well at some in, in some order. Uh, but I think Chase on just the explosiveness and just kind of just that pizzazz style of play he would be a home run pick for Atlanta at 16, in my opinion. Yep. I can't disagree. Uh, he do the way he gets after the quarterback, the way he bends. It's, it's unbelievable. So if you're a Falcons fan, get familiar with his name, get familiar with AJ Epinesa, maybe a Terrell Lewis or something out of Alabama. That might be a little rich for some, but it's still a possibility. Um, maybe a Yeter Gross Matos out of Penn State. Um, so just get familiar with probably an edge rusher and maybe even a trade down because I, we'll, we'll talk about part two, but I think we really like the idea of the New Orleans Saints and a potential quarterback. So um, we'll talk about part two next week. That was the first part of our mock drafts because if we do both parts, we do all 32, we'll be here all night long. So um, it'll end up being a seven round mock and it'll last 17 hours. And I don't think anybody wants that. So let's talk about some players that we have been watching as of the last couple of days or really over the last week or so. And um, we'll we'll elaborate, elaborate a little bit about each player. um, And then we'll get on out of here and um, preview next show or next week's show. But let's start with the guy that we talked about not so long ago, Makai Becton uh, out of Louisville. I was watching him and my goodness, man. Um, I don't know like how to really feel about him as a player. Like normally I have a pretty good grasp of things when I'm watching a guy after four or five games. I've wa- I watched five of his games and I'm like, I need to watch more and I'll, I'll probably watch some more this weekend, but I would prefer to watch the all 22. I was watching broadcast film, which sucks for watching offensive linemen. I don't care what anybody says. Uh-huh. You can watch the replays and you can see some things, but you, you, you it's so hard. It's so difficult. Yeah, from a technical perspective, it's almost impossible. Yeah, and I just, I'm, I'm so big into technique because in my opinion, if a guy doesn't have good technique, 
I'm not going to rank you very high. I'm not going to fall in love with your game because I got that much more work to do at the next level to make sure that you're a pro ready guy. And that's the thing, Makai Becton, it's hard for me to see if, if he's really pro ready or not, but I'll tell you what, from a, that's from a technical standpoint, but I'll tell you what, from every rep I started watching, I just started falling in love and like, I started falling in love more and more. I watched, I think three games and then I hit you up and I was like, dude, I'm not really seeing it with Makai Becton. Then I watched the game against Virginia. Then I watched his, um, cause the first game I watched was Louisville, Notre Dame. And then what was the other game I watched? I think I watched the game against, was it, I think it was Kentucky. And I was like, holy, you know what? This guy is, this guy's got some juice. This guy's, this guy's kind of got it. And I started like falling in love a little bit because he just, like you mentioned, was throwing dudes out of the way. And he just, like, I just don't know how to feel about him. I mean, it, it... He's a tough evaluation because it's like you can see all the goods and the reason why a lot of people fall in love with him and the, and a the reason why he's going to go in most likely the top half, if not top 20 of the draft, because mm-hmm. you see those physical attributes. And be honest, sometimes it's hard to find some guys that, you know, have that finishing ability or just want to, I mean, let's be honest, just kill the dude in front of them. And, yeah. and it's not nice to have that kind of nastiness. And especially when you're talking, you know, I gave him to, you know, Denver at left tackle for, you know, for Drew Locke, when you want to have your franchise quarterback, it's like, I want my guy that's his blindside protector to sit there and protect him and just, just beat the crap out of him. And that's what Becton does. So he kind of has that old school mentality where, you know, he may not be the tech most technically sound, but when you watch him, he's constantly, it's consistent nastiness. It's consistent, consistent finishing ability too. And sure his technique may not be, you know, the best, but, you know, sometimes, you know, would you just want the technique or would you want, you know, maybe just, you know, some technical flaws, but have that nasty demeanor and you have the length of a six, seven, 360 pound giant. A lot of teams are going to favor with the latter. And so I think that's maybe the, the situation we're dealing with. Sure. He may not be pretty as far as technique goes, but I think when you're just looking from a physical standpoint, it's going to be a lot of teams that fall in love with him. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to maybe believe in all the hype as a top 10 player, but it would not surprise me. Heck, I mean, you're talking about, you know, Dave Gettleman showing his hand. He fits the Dave Gettleman prototype if you're just talking about, you know, all the adjectives that he describes, you know, that powerful running game in between the tackles, nasty demeanor. I'm not saying he goes four overall, but, I mean, it makes a lot of sense if just that identity that he plays with. Yeah, I, I mean, that would be a huge – I think that would be a huge shock, and that would be maybe the, the part of the draft where it kind of starts going off the rails. And that's – I mean, that's it a, happens- Is that the Cleveland Furl? type shock or not yeah 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 I mean I would think for me it would be I just I think when you have guys like such sure things I think in Andrew Thomas and Jedrick Wills and then you go out and you take a guy like Makai Becton who let's be honest how many six seven three seventy offensive linemen are playing left tackle in the NFL it doesn't happen that often I think that's what's throwing me off because I'm like yeah the tape's okay but again or the tape's really good but like it's like you just don't see it. Like, and I guess like, okay, that's like the narrative of a six foot quarterback, like get out of there, Russ. But it's just like, is he really going to be able to match the speed of a, of a, of an edge rusher, like a Chandler Jones or a Khalil Mack? I mean, I get it. Khalil Mack's rushing from the left side of the defense. So he'd be getting after the right tackle, but you know, Von Miller, who's pretty much the same as Khalil Mack, but like, it's like, are you going to match those type of guys? Like if Chase Young was coming at him every time, would, would he beat him every time? I don't think so. And that's, I think, what would make me say, okay, I'm not taking this guy fourth. But at the same time, like, dude, the power is so real. And, like, watching his vertical sets, they didn't do a lot of them. They did a lot of those 45-degree sets on the pass sets. But, I mean, even, like, the jump sets, he does a pretty good job. It's not like it's terrible. Like, there's a couple where it's like, okay, this is way too slow or he – you know, and there's certainly times where I think he struggles with countering inside and figuring out who takes the looper. Like, is is he taking it or is the left guard taking it? But when you, like going back to your Denver pick, if they kept Garrett Bowles with Dalton Reisner and then they had Becton, holy crap. People are going to be thrown onto a bus because those guys are going to just finish. It just, it's going to be crazy. So 
I mean, we could sit here and talk back then all day. He's just such a tough evaluation for me. That's five tapes in. I'm hoping we land some all 22 on him so I can sit there and watch a little bit more from that perspective. But I like him. I really do. I like him. I think he's a first round type guy. Um, I think fourth's a little rich, but who's a guy that you've been watching the last couple of weeks that maybe he's been catching your eye. Maybe somebody's not talking about, or just, it doesn't really matter. Just somebody that's been uh, catching your eye. Yeah. Real quick to put a bow on Becton, you knew I wouldn't, you know, let you off right there. So two guys <laughs> that I think give hope to Becton that have similar measurables move a little similar to them. Orlando Brown, right tackle for Baltimore. And then you have Trenton Brown too, both about six, seven, six, eight range, three fifty plus. So, you know, you're talking about the guys, you know, can they keep up with the speed rushers? You know, I think, you know, uh, maybe consensusly, you know, if you're just looking across the board, I think, you know, Orlando Brown, he's, he's surpassed some of that uh, mm -hmm. expectation, you know, with the poor combine performance, blah, 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 blah. And, and sure, I got some of the criticism, but I'm like, guys, film's pretty good. You know, he's, and I know the media hounds got after him after that performance and everything, but he's showing, I mean, he blocked for one of the best rushing offenses in NFL history this past year. Uh, you know, he's a solid run blocker. And Trenton Brown, you know, big time contract, this, that, and the other. So I think those are two guys um, that, that you can definitely look at as far as just a projection standpoint. You're going to see those, uh, those uh, comparisons across the board throughout, but based on his, you know, style of play and, and just measurements in general, those are probably two guys you should compare him to. But to go back to answer your final question, um, a guy that I just turned on one game this morning was Ross Blacklock. I'm going to say Blaylock throughout the NFL draft season. I promise I will. But the defensive tackle for TCU, um, he shows – he kind of plays that shade to three-tech position. He shows some two-gapping ability. I'm still looking for maybe a little more splash plays. But you see that kind of lateral agility. You see kind of that fluidity, that athleticism to kind of penetrate and dip under some of those interior offensive linemen. So I'm really early on the study there. But uh, I think Blacklock's one of those guys that you were talking about, you know, that kind of prefaced your question. Some guys that – aren't really being talked about that much. And I think this interior defensive line class is kind of all over the place. So it may be kind of scheme fit, but I think Blacklock shows just a little bit of two gapping ability. I think that's kind of his bread and butter is just kind of to be that interior gap filler, maybe not these big time splash plays, but again, I'm only one game in. I started from the back end of the season with Baylor, which I need to go back to the front part in TCU's early part of the season. But um, I still th I see a lot of potential, but I've, I've yet to really kind of get a consensus report there on him. Staying on the TCU uh, train here, Jalen Rieger, I wrote about him this morning, um, wide receiver number one for TCU. Some people are really on the fence about him, and I've seen a lot of conversation about him um, on, on Twitter, and I'm for it. Uh, According to Sports Info Solutions, he had 92 targets this past year. Only 55 of those were catchable. Um, that's awful. That is that's god. I mean, I don't know what the normal like comparison numbers are, but that's horrible. Some guy that's like almost, that's almost 50. percent It was like no, they're uncatchable. What? Yeah, yeah, no. And Michael Pittman, I think, had like 130 targets, and he had I want to say like 101 receptions. So. Yeah, he had over 100. Yeah. So it's something like that. So he had like 130 targets and 101 receptions. And that was like with four different quarterbacks, three of them being freshmen. So, I mean, it's crazy. And, and Rieger finished with 43 receptions for 600 yards, like just over 605 touchdowns. But this is a guy that, you know, at 5'10", 5'11", a buck 95, maybe 200 pounds. I, like the stat line doesn't exactly match up to what you want to say as like a first round caliber guy, but because of today's NFL, it wouldn't surprise me if he snuck into the first round, especially considering the teams that are drafting at the back end, like Kansas city, like San Francisco, and even a team like green Bay. Like if green, if he was there for green Bay, like I, I know in my, in a spoiler, whatever second or uh, for next week's show, I had Van Jefferson go to green Bay after watching three more games of Jalen Rieger that would be the guy for me that I would want them to take. If I'm I had Brandon Ayuk, so I'm kind of in agreement with you. Two similar type players as well. So, yeah, I, I think yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, well, and, like, ever since they got rid of Brand Randall Cobb or didn't bring him back, they've kind of, like, missed, like, that little utility Swiss Army knife, if you will, to their offense in Green Bay. And I get it, Matt LaFleur is there now, so they're going to run the ball a little bit more. But they could put Rieger and they, they could – or is it Rieger, Rieger? I don't know. But if uh, – they had him, they could put him in the backfield 
they obviously could put him in the slot. They, you know, TCU, they had his speed always going towards the field side. So where it's wide open, they're putting Rieger in space and hoping he can make a play. And, you know, he only had 162 yards um, after the catch this past year, which is not a lot considering, you know, comparing to some other guys. But again, this is a guy that will make defenders miss in the short areas of the field. And I just, I think what I saw from him, I know the article says it, don't let the box score fool you. Don't let the box score fool you. It's 100% true. He's a different type of player compared to some other guys. He's not at that elite tier. He's probably not in tier one. He's probably near like, you know, the, the, the second tier, maybe closer to the third tier. He's more of a second round pick for me. But again, like I said, it wouldn't surprise me at all if he was a, a borderline first round pick by the time we get to April. So keep an eye on him. Um, do you have anybody else that you'd like to add? I think that's pretty much it. Um, you know, just been doing a lot of the, some of the back work in, uh, on the website. But, uh, yeah, I guess we're just going to stick with TCU. And, heck, we'll go ahead and, and knock out some Lucas Niang. Like I said, I need to do a full evaluation on him. And cause there's some buzz of him possibly being in the back, back end of that first round. Again, you know, with all the offensive tackle, you know, potential, you know, we're going to mention some guys next week as an Austin Jackson, the tackle from USC, and Josh Jones from Houston who – had one of the more consistent senior bowl weeks. Those are two guys that, you know, I think a lot of teams are going to covet in that back half of the first round. And that's going to force a lot of offensive tackles up, you know, whether we think that's the best idea or not, I think Lucas Niang could be one of those guys that kind of falls in that mold as well. So I think maybe just sticking on TCU and, and maybe looking at Jeff Gladney, who we did not get to see at the senior bowl, but we know he's a potential first round guy too at corner. So TCU, they got some studs this year, I guess an underwhelming season, but they got some studs. Yeah, no, they really do. And Darius Anderson's another guy at running back. I love him in his zone run offense. Uh, his ability on outside zone is incredible. Like his his way to to see that cutback lane and take it. It's he's he's pretty solid. I, I really would like him in Detroit if I uh, if I'm being honest. So um, yeah, no, we've got a ton of great stuff coming down the line here from you know more player evaluations. Like you've talked about, you're going to be doing some on a couple of other TCU guys and then just, you know, obviously whatever else you come across over the next couple of weeks. Um, we'll probably have uh, another mock draft or two coming out, not this week or even next week, but maybe by the end of the month or something. Um, obviously, every week we've got a new episode of the podcast. We've been doing Fridays. We might do one sooner. The only way that you guys will stay up to date on the podcast is if you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker.com, uh, Google Play, however you go about listening to your podcast. So make sure you find Cover One Draft Podcast, download it, subscribe to it, and then obviously rate and review. The more ratings and reviews that we get, the more podcasts that we can provide for you. So next week we will do a combine preview. There were some certainly uh, studs, duds, and snubs on uh, the combine today. So we will go over that next week. We'll do part two of our mock drafts um, and we'll elaborate more on the, you know, picks 17 through 32. Uh, you guys can obviously find us on Twitter at Russ NFL draft at underscore Christian page. So you guys enjoy the rest of your Friday until next time. This is cover one, the draft podcast.